Hey DC, this is Harvey and welcome to the latest video upload for my channel Spinning the Black Circle. Uh, we're in the middle of a mini storm in the UK so um, if you hear any strange noises in the background that is the remains of Storm Freya passing through England. Uh, I'm just hoping that the roof and the ceiling stay intact at least for the remainder of this video that would be that would be nice. Um, so welcome. Uh, quite an interesting topic today um, which, which I've been I've been thinking about which is do the, do the current crop of contemporary artists and and uh, acts uh, do they match up to the so-called classic canon of rock and pop artists? And uh, there's certainly a view that the, the golden age of music is over, although it's more and more difficult to find artists that match things that that um, you know that were that were popular 30, 40 uh, years ago. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just examine that, test it out a little, and the way I'm gonna do that is I've selected four classic albums by um, reputationally classic artists and I will pit those against four uh, artists of a similar subgenre uh, um, from a, a more, from the last three, four, five years, contemporary artists, and just test that out and just see, see if there's validity to that suggestion. It's obviously highly subjective, but it should be fun to just to just um, test it out and then summarise at the end uh, what I think of that, of the suggestion that, uh, that the quality is dipped. Um, so it's not that out with probably the the classic um, indie bedsitter album, and that is uh, "The Queen Is Dead" by The Smiths, regarded by many as their their watershed or best album. And I, I, I probably wouldn't argue with that. It's um, Morrissey at his most uh, arch and and cynical best. Johnny Marr at the top of his game, and just one of those albums where everything came together. Uh, and it's a it's a classic album in every way, shape, and form. Um, so you know, is it is it is it possible in this day and age to release an LP that that matches that or has that sort of cultural impact? Probably not. But does that mean there's nothing currently that 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 is in the subgenre that's worthwhile? And I think the answer is yes. Yes, there is music that's in the subgenre that's worthwhile. Uh, and one of those is by an Australian band whose debut full album. Uh, came out last year. This is by the Rolling Blackout Cultural Fever, and and this is their debut LP, Hope Downs, one of my albums of twenty eighteen. This is the uh, indies only um, version of it. It came out on Sub Pop last year. Beautiful, beautifully packaged, um, and it does. It's it's not the Queen is Dead by the Smiths uh, in any way, shape, or form, but it's it's influenced by it. And if this had been released in nineteen eighty six, which is when the Queen is Dead came out. It certainly would have been a popular LP, and I think these guys would have been a huge band. Um, uh, certainly, the guitar works heavily influenced by the Smiths. Uh, the songwriting is consistent throughout, and uh, and they've got a certain X factor and flair um, to their to their execution and delivery. And I, and I do think this is a great LP that people could still be listening to in ten years. I think the, the distinction is that it, it it can't possibly have the cultural impact that the Smiths had in that release because it's been done. It's been done. And so is this just repetition? No. But has it got a hope of being, you know, of being of having that sort of uh, reaching that sort of status? Uh no it hasn't. But uh it's worthwhile any Smiths fan getting a hold of this. It's not it's not plagiarism, it's not just a rip off of the Smiths, it's a similar genre and it's a very, very good LP. So that's exhibit one. Uh challenging the theory that there isn't anything worthwhile out there. The second one, I think, is a is a much more close run thing. You might be surprised by this um, until I explain uh, uh, the selections. So the first is um, what many regard as the greatest rap stroke hip hop LP ever made, and it it even it even comes uh, scores highly on many of the best album ever lists. And that's it takes a nation of million to hold us back by Public Enemy. Uh, again, an album where everything just came together. Uh, you know, Black Steel and the Hour of Chaos was on here. Don't believe the hype's on here and bring the noise. Um, you know, it's brutal, hard driving rap, but culturally really significant. These guys were on the apparently on the FBI uh, list to to kind of keep an eye on them because because of the influence they were having on on uh, black youths at the time. Uh, and and I guess you know nobody had heard anything like this when this came out. It was it was direct, politically astute. Um, you know, in the know music that had something to say and deservedly so has, has kept its place in, in the pantheon of great rap LPs. 
So can anything contemporary in the rap hip hop world uh, come close to It Takes a Nation of Millions? And actually there is a rap album that I think does, and many think does, and that is this LP by Kendrick Lamar called To Pimp a Butterfly. Uh, this is, um, I think, one of the best rap albums ever made, and that's a strong statement. Uh, you know, cu culturally, what it means lyrically, how it reflects its times in terms of the zeitgeist, and and the songwriting, and uh, and also the way it, it interplays jazz into rap seamlessly, uh, like I haven't heard any other rap album do. Yes, I've heard rap albums, rap artists successfully incorporate jazz, Tribe Called Quest spring to mind, but this does it. Uh, it's it's the synthesis of or something that was massively popular, US Billboard number one LP, but is really smart and actually takes lots of risks, you know. Um, so, and, and I think it does, this actually does match up to Public Enemies, um, it takes a nation of millions, and some might argue it's even better. I don't know, I haven't made that direct comparison, but it certainly holds its own in terms of something that in any era, um, if you like this subgenre, it stands up. So that's interesting, isn't it? Because I think, you know, uh, certainly a lot of people are calling this the greatest rap album ever or one of the greatest rap albums ever. So it's not just my subjective opinion coming through. It's the subjective opinion of many other, many other record buyers. So that's an interesting comparison. Uh, what's next? I'm going to go to kind of uh, indie electronica now um, and um, an album that I'm sure is beloved of many in the VC community. Uh, this is Treasure by the Cocteau Twins. This is a 2018 Ratio, which is a fantastic ratio uh, campaign, by the way, of the, the Cocteau Twins albums. Uh, I think this is their their best LP for me anyway. It's where the, it kind of defines the Cocteau Twins sound. Uh, still can't understand a word of the lyrics. I don't think you're supposed to. It's kind of gibberish lyrics, but the soundscapes and, and uh, Liz Fraser's voice. Cocteau Twins are the best, um, you know, really angular, but also also incredibly beautiful. So cultural impact. Um, pr probably, but on a but on a but on a really, on a really quiet level. You know, this this wasn't mainstream, was it? But but certainly, I'm sure lots of bands and lots of people quietly influenced by Cocteau Twins, and obviously they're a hugely well regarded outfit. So, is there a is there a contemporary indie stroke electronic band um, with that sort of keyboard wash sound uh, that could match the Cocteau Twins, or at least hold a candle to them? And the one I would put forward on that basis is um is by uh Polisa and this is their second LP I think called United Crushers. Uh it's absolutely stupendous album. It's certainly more electronic than the Cocteau Twins were certainly guitar was um part of the Cocteau but twin sound, but it's got that same kind of wash of the kind of uh indie kind of ethereal sound to it, and it's an amazing LP. And again, I think if this had been released Contemporaneous with those 80s Cocteau Twins albums it would have been huge. These guys are pretty popular, but not in, on any sort of level will they sell the sorts of albums that the Cocteau Twins sold or have the sort of influence that the Cocteau Twins had. But they're really worthwhile if you're a Cocteau Twins fan or if you're into that, into The Cure or into Depeche Mode or or that 80s electronic that indie sound, then this is really worthwhile. It's beautifully packaged as well. By the way, this is a kind of pink... Um, uh pink uh in the uh, rose rose pink indie version of it um which i've put in the gauka sleeve but but yeah uh united colors by by police their second lp i think does again book that suggestion that there isn't anything worthwhile if you're a cock to a twins fan uh one one last um one last uh um comparison and i'm gonna go to uh to prog so uh, this could be quite controversial for those in the those prompt fans in the VC community. So this is, um, I think, an original um, or very early pressing on the Plum label of um, of Yes's uh, Yes's Fragile. Again, many many regard this as well, certainly one of the classic Yes albums with their classic lineup. Uh, it's a great LP. I, I love it, and I've loved it since I was a, since I was a kid. This was my brother's copy that he gave to me when I was, I think, when I was about eleven or twelve. Uh, so the very old, uh, as I say, probably original print of that. So yes, definitely in the canon of early classic uh, prog bands, you know, a, a British institution. Um, and so can anything, um, any, any 
uh, contemporary product product get close to to this sort of level. And again, I think I think I've got an album that surpasses Yes is Fragile, uh, which would be controversial to say, but by a British artist named Stephen Wilson. Uh, and this is a, this is his LP uh, Hand Cannot Erase, I think from twenty twenty sixteen from memory, uh, double LP. Um, and this is a this is a concept LP, uh, all about the kind of alienation of modern society. It's a it's based on a true story actually of a of a of a woman who who uh, had a, had a uh, you know a good job, uh, young woman, good job, decent career. She moved into a flat in I think it was London on her own, and kind of switched off from society. And even though she had friends and family, uh, they didn't know where she was for a couple of years, and she kind of fell out of society and then was found. I think a year after she died in her own flat, she was found because the neighbours noticed the stench from the flat she was living in. And and obviously uh and obviously, you know, the, the, the door was the door was um uh, the door was opened and there and there she was. So the the theme is that how you can kind of disappear in modern society. Quite a heady heady theme and and, and almost become anonymous. Uh, you know, in the, in the, in the, ironically, in the age of in the information age where everything's everything's at the touch of a button, how you can kind of just disappear, which is what happened to this lady. So it's a concept album, kind of, you know, just noodling on that theme of alienation and and how you can just just fall away in the, in this in this huge society, in the modern era, um, and it does for me. This is one of the greatest prog LPs I've heard. Uh, yes, this artist is. Um, in his 40s, so you could argue, well, he's not a new artist because he was in a band called Porcupine Tree before he was a solo artist. But this is a contemporary album by someone who's got a current career. He's not at the end of his career. It's not Neil Young. It's not, you know, it's not Bruce Springsteen. It's, it's, he is a contemporary artist. And this, I think, is one of the greatest prog LPs I've ever heard. I've, I've heard him play it in its entirety live. Absolutely stupendous, amazing musicianship throughout. The concept's superb in, in, in the songwriting. And as a, as a concept LP, I think it holds a candle up with the very greatest prog LPs. So my last uh, piece of evidence that everything's not falling off a cliff is Hand Cannot Erase by uh, by Stephen Wilson. Um, so what's that telling us then? So again, highly subjective. I think there's three things that are clear that are kind of um, that are kind of swaying people's judgment a little on this. I think uh, the first thing that there's a is that there's a certain mystique to, or there was a certain mystique to artists not being very visible think about the the 70s and 80s you couldn't you couldn't uh, there wasn't any such thing as google you couldn't go online and see what an artist had tweeted you couldn't you couldn't you know um you couldn't search for youtube videos uh, of them showing the, you know the uh performing three three songs of the current lp you know live in the studio you didn't know what they were up to it was almost like these artists you know like the smiths or like led zeppelin or like black south one mount olympus and you took kind of snippets of what you could find in a magazine like NME or or in the, in the States Rolling Stones. So I think the availability factor and the fact that there's so much music out there and the, and the artists are so readily accessible, I think that sways people's people's judgment. I think that's point one. I think point two is that, that we've got to be careful not to equate sales with quality. So just because it, we had a time where records were more mainstream and more people bought them on whatever format it was, but you had that kind of boom in the 70s and 80s when it was a culturally a massive thing. And, and you, if you like music, your access point was to buy an album in some form. Just because that's dropped away, that doesn't mean it's because the quality has dropped. It's just that society's changed. You know, uh, so um, so I think that's point two. Um, and I think the third point is just, just that the, it, it has all been done in the sense that after twenty to thirty years, between sixty-two, I guess, and uh, and ninety-two, you know, all that exploration around anything you could do, um, you know, with with uh, you know, with the range of instruments and notes and 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 and, uh, and the human voice, it had been done to a certain extent. So that doesn't mean that everything's just being repeated now, but it does mean that you're just looking at tweaks on a theme because we've gone through all of that. But that does not mean that there's nothing worthwhile. It doesn't mean that we're falling off a cliff. Um, so I think those three together, I think that uh, a part of it is an age thing as well. I think that the people who are who are buying music now, who um, who um, young people who view it through view it through a lens of of you know streaming from Spotify or 
buying individual tracks. That's a, that places a different emphasis on on an album compared to slightly older people like me. So I think that's where's judgment too. But overall, I think we're looking at you know there there will always be incredibly talented musicians and artists out there, and and you've got to you've got to pick and choose and listen. And if you do that, I think there's a lot of great music for you to find. So um so yeah, it's a, like interested to hear your views. You know, comment like. Uh, subscribe if you like this video but i think let's summarize like this the golden age of music may be over but there's a lot of golden music out there how's that for a cliche to end on uh thanks very much uh i may do one more video tonight which is uh recent finds i bought a few lps over the weekend but thanks for listening and i'll see you next time bye